everyone, this is Rob Kinks for the Freedom Report and Citizens for Sale Money. And I have a very special guest here with me today. It's Mel Madison, who has experience working in Wall Street, essentially. And it's going to give us a good background today on the origination of central banks. Some interesting facts about how the banking system got started and how it evolved. And then he's also going to give us uh, his views on the modern central bank digital currencies and the concerns he may have there as you have on your screen from his website, melmadison.com. He's held key posts with both, established, with both established asset managers such as Russell Investments and startup firms like United Capital. In 2019, he's focused almost exclusively on private equity. Um, you're a graduate of Duke University, I believe, and you've served as CEO of several different FINRA and SEC registered broker dealers. You have an MBA with concentrations in investment corporate finance from Duke University. And I believe you're still a certified financial planner. Uh, so go ahead, uh, Mel, and, and take it away. Give us a little bit of, of your background, if you wish, and then lead us through sort of the original creation of the central banking model and, uh, you know, in, any interesting details you may have on that. Sure. Well, thanks for having me, Rob. As you mentioned in your intro, you know, I have a background working in traditional financial services. And I also throughout this whole 20 plus year uh, finance career have been a bit of an amateur uh, financial historian, uh, reading scores of books on financial history, deep dives into things like Bretton Woods or the Great Depression era, different monetary uh, histories, uh, biographies and backgrounds on you know the Rothschilds or what have you. And so basically I take a real world kind of understanding of how how money moves in our world today, combine it with some of my historical uh, research and try to help you know bring the story of what's really going on with central banking, monetary policy in a way that is not what you're going to get, say, presented through some of the mainstream media and definitely not what you're going to hear uh, from a typical explanation of what the Fed is from somebody like a, a Jerome Powell. So uh, to, to talk a little bit about central banking, I think it's important to understand the roots of the central bank, what the real purpose of the central bank was, why, why did all of a sudden central banks come into existence? Um, and you really have to go back to the late 1600s, 1694 uh, was when the Bank of England was set up. That's basically the, the mother of all central banks. There was a central bank, I believe, in Sweden that's a little bit older. Uh, but really, the Bank of England is kind of the template that that was used. And, you know, the, the main reason why it was set up, it wasn't what you might hear of like, oh, well, we needed a Federal Reserve to to smooth out the business cycle. It was really a way to siphon wealth and, and money, in this case, gold and silver, away from the people and into the hands of the king who, who needed money uh, to fight foreign wars, particularly one he was preparing against France. And the reason the sovereign needed this money was William III uh, had basically taxed his people to the breaking point and he could no longer gain access to funds through increased taxation. He also had borrowed money from, from bankers and defaulted. He, he was a, unable to pay back the bankers and the bankers said, well, your credit's over. So they said, well, what would be an innovative way for us to funnel money to the sovereign? And they came up with the central bank. And the idea was give these uh, bankers the exclusive right to create paper money, uh, to create Bank of England notes, and essentially force the British economy to use these notes as money, and then thereby getting the people to deposit their gold and silver so they can get the paper notes from the Bank of England. And then the, the gold and silver can be loaned out to the king, who can use it to pay shipbuilders, pay uh, military personnel, et cetera, et cetera, to fund the war. And so it became a funding mechanism for the sovereign, for the government, using the people's money in a way that was kind of outside of the taxation realm. And that that system has perpetuated itself. And the way that the tax ultimately gets applied is through uh, inflation. And so, uh, you know, when you look at even in our country, in the United States and its founding, there were revenue crises in the 17 late 1700s that needed to be addressed. And, you know, we didn't have the income tax. And so they said, okay, well, we could do a land tax, but it needed to be 
apportioned according to the states. That was the constitutional rules back then. That didn't really work well. Uh, it kind of favored the, the the more agrarian states. Didn't favor as much, you know, some of the smaller states. And so they settled on, you know, well, let's tax luxury goods like leather saddles, uh, alcohol, whiskey, and these taxes were just met with essentially rejection. We had the whiskey rebellion, the first kind of armed insurrection in the United States history. And it was really at that point when I think the mentality just settled into place. The best way to tax, to tax the democratic population is through inflation. And it's just, we're going to have a ballooning debt. Um, we're going to continually increase this debt. Is, our currency is going to debase. And, and this is just the way that we're going to essentially garner taxes. And it's had different guises. There have been periods where, you know, we were more uh, firmly rooted in a gold standard period where we weren't. Um, and so the battle has kind of ebbed and flowed. But where we've settled out, you know, today is essentially at a pure fiat system, uh, you know, no ties at all to real money. And by real money, I'm, I'm meaning gold, basically. And and so we've now also entered into this, you know, inflation regime uh, that I think while there might be a bit of a respite going on now is is only set to continue in years ahead. And so, you know, that's kind of a, a, a long arc. I skipped over a lot of stuff, but I think the main point is just to understand the, the initial purpose of a central bank, which it still is today, which is a, 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 a way to siphon money from the people to the to the government. Yeah, and in talking about the history of the central bank, um, some of the things you've been talking about were not only the creation of the central banks, but the creation of the Bank for Inter International Settlements. And my viewers and followers will be familiar with that through a lot of the content we've covered the last few years, such as the Basel III, um, sort of redefining high quality liquid assets and requirements uh, for the banking system post uh, the 2008 financial crisis and also through the creation of the CBDCs. But I think you have some interesting history, especially in the early years for our viewers on the Bank for National Settlements. So perhaps you could kind of walk us through how it was, created, what it really exists for. It, a lot of people don't understand. I think a lot of people understand the U.S. dollar. They understand we have different currencies. They understand we have a central bank. But most people's understanding of the banking system stops there. Yeah. supranational sort of agencies <clears throat> like the IMF and, BM and BIS, people don't really understand them in, in their role. And they don't understand how those entities can affect policy for the world's central banks and, and lending and that type of thing and currency in general. So perhaps you can kind of walk us through what is the BIS and how, how does it fit into this overall puzzle of the central banking system? Yeah, so <clears throat> the BIS, Bank for International Settlements, was created in uh, May 1930, and it, its original function was really to uh, facilitate reparations payments from Germany to the Allied victors, you know, France, United States, United Kingdom, Belgium. But that reason for existence quickly quickly faded away. So we were right at the beginning of the Depression in 1930, and uh, Germany very soon after stopped, you know, making reparations payments. And so the BIS really morphed and it, it's morphed over the years now into this secretive, uh, super governmental uh, agency where they really facilitate a lot of the, you know, World Economic Forum globalist type agenda items from a monetary point of view. Uh, so technically, they, you know, in their mission statement, they're defined as the central bank for central banks. And what what this used to mean was the idea was uh, it's a little inefficient for when central banks need to do large gold transfers to be transferring this gold around. And so you had these large vaults that would hold a lot of gold and the BIS would actually be the holder of the gold. Um, on the, the books and records, if you will, of, for example, the, the New York Fed or the Bank of England. These are the traditional largest gold vaults. So um, to this day, a lot of central bank gold is held under the Bank of England, as well as under the New York Fed, not just BOEs or, or the Fed's gold, but the gold of other countries. And we're starting to see some of these countries repatriate their gold, uh, start to bring it back. 
but but what it used to be is it would be held in these vaults um, in Switzerland, UK, and in New York, and it would be held in the BIS's name. And if the Bank of Reserve Bank of India wanted to do a gold transfer to, you know, the Bank of England, they could just do a book entry on the the Bank for International S Settlements accounts and not have to physically transfer the gold. And so this initial role is becoming the central bank for central banks. Um, even that role then began to morph more into the enablement of international finance. So uh, during World War II, you had a number of the directors um, at the BIS that were uh, closely tied to the, to the Nazi party. Uh, you had the BIS carry out things that, you know, most people thought were simply ludicrous. So, for example, when when Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia, he essentially put a gun to the head of the Czech central bankers and said, tell the, the BIS to transfer all of Czechoslovakia's national gold to, to Germany. And the Czech bankers, because they literally had guns to their head, said, okay, we'll, we'll tell the BIS to do it, but they'll never do it. They're never going to actually give Germany all this gold. Uh, but lo and behold, they did. And they not only made the transfer on their books, but then when Germany requested physical delivery, <clears throat> they emptied out some of their vaults that they had in Amsterdam at the time and physically delivered, you know, the gold to Berlin to help fund the Third Reich. And there are all kinds of these types of examples of the BIS facilitating uh, Nazi Germany's connection to international financiers. Uh, and I think that there's even a, an argument that could be made as to one of the reasons why Hitler never invaded Switzerland was precisely because he needed this conduit open. He he obviously went into other countries that had declared themselves as neutral, uh, such as Norway or I believe um, you know uh, Belgium, I think, and, and some other some other countries, uh, Holland, I think. The, these countries had declared themselves as ne neutral, but Hitler went into them regardless. Uh, the one neutral country that he respected their neutrality was Switzerland, and as I said, I think that was part of this uh, Third Reich. And I think the Third Reich connections kind of lived on. I'll, I'll take a pause there, but um, you know, post-World War II, we saw a lot of the Third Reich's agenda implemented, including a common currency under uh, the offices of a central bank based in uh, Frankfurt, Germany. Okay, and in, and in your notes, um, show notes and things that we're gonna talk about, or the middle years, the the BISS role and creation of the Euro globalization and, and that type of thing. So perhaps you can bring us up to date on that, you know, post all of this stuff, World War II um, time frame. Did the did the BISS role grow more significant and how so? And and how did it go from being the type of entity you just described, you know, the reparations and the gold transfers to being something that was more widely recognized and even led to the creation of, um, you know, a, a, you know, a common currency for the European trade union. So I think the BIS is, it's really the place where these internationalist um, financiers kind of feel most at home. I think it, it's their safe haven. It's their Vatican city in a way. And I use that term Vatican city because uh, BIS grounds are more or less a sovereign nation. They are protected in the same way that embassies are protected as extraterritorial, meaning not part of the, the home country. So the BIS premises have these protections. Uh, BIS managers are able to travel with diplomatic pouches free from search. Uh, it's written into uh, international law that any actions taken by BIS managers um, in the name of the bank are immune from prosecution. Uh, the the BIS, even though it generates a profit, pays absolute and it and its shares actually used to trade on a, on the exchange in, in Switzerland, um, is exempt from taxes, so that they they pay no taxes. Their employees pay no taxes. They have like triple redundant fire systems, bunkers, infirmaries. They essentially have an entire encapsulated, you know, sovereign piece of ground by international treaty. Um, it, from which to operate. And, and, and if you think about how different they are from other organizations, like even the Federal Reserve, at, at least there's the um, 
nominal, you know, uh, charade, I guess, almost of congressional oversight uh, with the Fed. But who who has oversight over the BIS? Right. It's a, it's this international organization that operates immune from law and it has absolutely you know, no like country or parliament that can come in and say, here's what you need to do, or we're going to take away your budget. They, they generate enough money to operate through gold, uh, at least they're heavy into the gold market. Um, and what they've been able to do as this kind of think tank playground operational center for financial uh, globalists is they've been able to use that to be, to put in whatever global type agenda they want. So, Post World War II, you know, before we had the ECB, which is headquartered in Frankfurt, they had to create the euro, the eurozone, the European Union. All of this was done in the BIS headquarters building. That was where all the leadership of the ECB uh, parked and and put together the framework before they opened their offices in Germany. Uh, they they had basically you know uh, white papers and thinking about you know, what this common currency is, what is the ECB's mandate going to be, all this stuff flowed out of the BIS. And what we're seeing now, just like the, the Euro and the European Union zone, we're seeing this further globalist push come out of the BIS innovation hub. The BIS has a number of projects, things like Enbridge, um, Jura, Orum, which is the Latin word for gold, uh, all of these projects where they release these white papers like blueprints for the future monetary system, global CBDCs uh, or CBDCs, as well as like tokenization of assets, real world assets they want to tokenize. And so all that agenda is kind of being set through the BIS, through these secretive bi-monthly meetings that occur where the central bank heads of 63 top 63 central banks around the world, they come, they meet in secret, they don't release minutes, they don't allow the press, and they they kind of chart a course for the global monetary system behind closed doors, and then they carry that out and execute it in their home countries. I think one of the key things you mentioned there, and, and I think where people have a disconnect is, we'll tend to focus on our own jurisdiction. So we here in the US tend to focus on the US, and we think that they were completely sovereign, but if our central bankers are meeting, you know, at the BIS and deciding policy, doesn't that mean that we're really more subject to international uh, policy and e even secretive international policy we're not even aware of that's guiding your, you know, our own monetary system? And isn't, you know, why doesn't the US Congress or various Congresses around the world? hold their central banks to account for this I, you never see it in pre in in you know for example when powell or when bernanke or greenspan or or any of those people went in front of congress i i never see a line of questioning around the bis and how the bis may be shaping monetary policy you know for the fed here in the us but obviously i mean that's part of what's being done um, why is that? Why do the nation, individual nation states not, um, why do they not question you know, the true independence of the central banks given, you know, the BIS and their secretive policy? And at what point, you know, a, a lot of times I see Congress questioning the, the, the Fed chairs not understanding their behavior. And it seems like they're completely disconnected from where the Fed may be taking you know, their cues from in terms of what their policy is going to be going forward. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think they do. And I think, you know, the BIS, like, you know, their headquarters building is where all the Basel Accords are being put together. And so I think they just don't even want their name in the spotlight. So they just call it Basel III. Um, but it's Basel because that's where the, the BIS is headquartered and the organization that puts together these rules is is headquartered in the, in the BIS building. And so these this, I think a lot is done to just obfuscate it. Like, you know, Powell, I mean, if that guy sneezes, whatever he does, they talk about, but you don't hear about when he's at the BIS. So just a few weeks ago, for example, there was a uh, central bank conference, public conference in Sintra, Portugal. And, you know, there was a big, long interview that 
Christine Lagarde and Jerome Powell and the head of the Brazilian Central Bank did uh, broadcast on, on CNBC and elsewhere. Um, and they, they asked questions and they're in central Portugal, but nobody even brought up the fact of why were all these central bankers in Europe? It was because over the course of the weekend prior to Sintra, uh, the BIS held their annual meeting and they all had, so they were able to have this annual meeting, meet in, 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 in secret, essentially get on the same page and then immediately go to Portugal and then kind of begin to broadcast that out. And then they go back to their home countries and they begin to implement that policy. So I think, you know, if you look at, you know, Jerome Powell right now, he's laying the groundwork, I believe, for cuts probably in September. And the the narrative that he's liking to to push to explain the reason to cut is that he's begin to see better balance in the labor market and therefore they don't need to be as restrictive and therefore it makes sense to cut rates. But I, I, I actually don't see the, the softness in the labor market that, that Paul is seeing. I think, you know, just a couple of bullet points on that. Number one is what's one of the main reasons cited that they're seeing softness is they're saying the unemployment rate is going up. And if you look at the actual breakdown of what's driving that increase in the unemployment rate, even in the Bureau of Labor Statistics own numbers, it's very clearly that it's being driven by an increase in unemployed foreign born population. So in the household survey, they have a table, table A7 of household data. It breaks down foreign born employment versus native born. And if you look at, for example, native born um, employment, unemployment rate for native born men, one year ago it was 4.0%. In the last report, it was 4.2%. So if you're looking at what's going on with a native born mint, there's no meaningful increase in the unemployment rate. It's gone up 0.2% over the course of a year. But if you look at what's happened in the unemployment rate of foreign born men, it was 2.7% a year ago, and now it's 4.1%. That's where the, the, the unemployment increase is coming from. And then it, you can break it down further and you can see that the uh, the number of employed, meaning the actual people working native uh, foreign born men went from about 17 million to 17 and a half million. But the unemployment rate went up from 2.7 to 4.1 because the total population of foreign born men looking for jobs went from 17.5 million to around 18.5 million. So th this is what's happening in the labor market. There was a, a labor shortage created by COVID and Trump administration policies, that labor shortage needed to be addressed by essentially opening up the floodgates of uh, illegal immigration so that you could get that 2.7% foreign born rate up to four. They've now done that. Um, and so that's what's caused the increase in the unemployment rate. So there's nothing that I'm seeing in the employment data, whether it's initial jobless claims, if you're looking at the number of jobs being created, the non-farms payroll report, that's still going strong. And all we're doing is we're having an increase in the unemployment rate because there's been such an increase in the foreign born population. Now that does not argue for me for a reason to cut rates, but when you take a step back and you look at it through the global mindset, and you realize that most countries are not like the United States with fixed rate mortgages. Countries like the UK or Germany or France, they, they have mortgages that reset. The, these mortgages are going to begin to reset. If they start resetting and the mortgage rates are going to be 7% and most of these people's uh, adjustable rates were 25 or 3%, you know, you, you're going to have a massive uh, economic uh, slow down, massive recession. And so I think a lot of what's driving the Federal Reserve's decisions is the understanding that the Federal Reserve acts in many ways as the central bank for the world, uh, controlling the world's money supply, and that you know they feel a need to cut rates in order to support growth in places like Europe. But of course, Powell's never going to come up in front of Congress and say he's cutting rates so that the UK housing market doesn't uh, go under. Okay, so talk a little bit about um, CBDCs and control of purchasing and also uh, the direction towards universal basic income. And how do those two things sort of fit into the overall picture of monetary policy and perhaps even, I would say, political control? Because couldn't those be used as a political control tools or cultural control tools, if you will? 
Yes, I think we've we've seen the the financial system become more weaponized in recent years, whether you're talking about the Canadian truckers or you're talking about uh, on the international scene with the weaponization of the dollar against Russia and other adversaries. And so the we're now in a situation where it's very difficult um, to use some of the old methods of control. So the, you know, we live in a nuclear world, um, you know, the, the, the global economic war, the geoeconomic war that's going on with Russia and China and the United States and India, it's not a hot war where we're uh, sending, you know, missiles at each other, although there are proxy wars going on, obviously, but basically, you know, it's an economic war. And I think that the, the global central bank, um, push or, or the push by central banks around the globe to implement uh, central bank digital currencies are just understanding this is this is a great way for us to be able to control the population. This is a great way for us to when we want to inject stimulus into the economy to just get money right into people's hands. This is a way that we can do different social control. So it has programmability is the word they use on it. Um, it can be used to further climate agendas. Uh, DEI agendas, uh, you know, for example, you, you know, you can get a better interest rate if your climate credit, social climate score is good, or if you buy an EV car or so, or, so to kind of affect control to put into place some of these policies that they've been uh, working on for decades now. And so I think the, the central bank digital currency um, really is, is two things. One, it's that social control and, and giving, uh, a bunch of uh, kind of tools in the toolkit that they didn't have before. But it's also, uh, you know, there's a worry that they're losing control of the monetary system. And I think they're worried about uh, stable coins. They're worried about Bitcoin. I think they're worried about gold and silver. I think, you know, they're, they're worried that people are catching on to the, to the trick, that the jig is kind of getting up and that people are starting to lose faith in the dollar as being able to hold any type of purchasing power, whether we're talking about individuals or like we were talking about offline before with some individual states um, saying, hey, we have maybe budget surpluses. We have multi-year projects we're planning. If we just keep it in USD, um, it, it's essentially no longer a store of value. It's, it's losing its store of value. Um, uh, imprintor and it never really had it but it, at least people kind of you know were a little clueless to it and now now they're understanding that the dollar you know it's not money you know it's it doesn't have a store of value it's it's a unit of exchange it, it can be a unit of account it can be a currency but it's no longer looked at as a store of value uh to be held as a reserve asset and to basically you know it's basically a credit instrument it's a credit instrument against the federal reserve that pays zero percent interest and so as long as you're in an inflationary environment you're going to get a negative real rate of return on dollars and people understand that and they're moving into these other things now what i would add what makes things like stable coins extremely dangerous to them is that if people were to put money into stable coins and then buy like t-bills they're now circumventing the entire commercial banking fractional reserve mm -hmm. system where jp morgan takes our checking deposits pays us basically 0% interest and then levers those up and goes out and sprinkles it all around the economy. And this is essentially, you know, the way that the, the money creation of the banks works. And if you hold your money in a stable coin or you hold it in gold or you hold it in silver, you're now, you know, circumventing that system. And um, that's part of the recent legislation. Senators uh, Loomis and Gillibrand just came out with a stablecoin payment act bill a month ago uh, that is going to mandate that anybody that runs a stablecoin uh, that owns T-bills to back it is going to have to custody those at a Federal Reserve Bank uh, so that those monies stay into the to the capital reserve ratios of the banks that they can then you know lever up and and loan out and so these threats to the monetary system they're seeing cbdc's as kind of a, a way to do that um and, and i think they've even got their plan b that if people use stable coins that are going to be ostensibly issued by a private company they're going to find a way through the back door uh cbdc to come in there and essentially take control of those assets put them on federal reserve uh, bank balance sheets, uh, not Federal Reserve Bank, but banks that are part of the Federal Reserve system 
Um, and that's that's how that's going to happen. Yeah, it seems as though they may be OK with alternative payment systems as long as they're getting credit for it. So in other words, they're trying to keep close ended this system of dollar and maybe eventually central bank digital dollar, digital currency and uh, the debt system. And uh, that's been part of my theory as to why they're trying to regulate Bitcoin and, and some of these private crypto networks is if you can bring it under regulation, you can then push them towards um, back into the banking system, back into the normal banking laws. And to me, that's one of the big threats to any sort of independent um, currency or independent uh any anything whether it be a digital coin going back to gold and silver is they don't want people pulling money out of this ecosystem which they're trying to control because if there's a way to pull it out then it can circumvent their ability to control aggregate money supply which going back to the old economists um, seems to be what they want to control they they need to control aggregate money supply and by controlling that aggregate money supply they have essentially de facto control over the leverage and they can direct economy in any which way they wish. Anything that pulls money out of that and and takes away their ability to control that monetary flow and the creation, the destruction, uh, and their ability through government like tax policy to incentivize certain behaviors uh, pulls away really from the central bankers' uh, monopoly on money. Um, what is your view on, do you think things are going to come to a head where you mentioned that, you know, I'm at the Bitcoin conference now for anybody that's watching this video and we're talking about here at the Bitcoin conference about um, it, we had a conversation earlier today about somebody trying to set up like a Bitcoin bank. And it's very difficult to do in the U.S. because the, the type of regulations, it's very difficult to pass all those regulations in each state. And then, you know, at the federal level to, to be able to do a Bitcoin bank. So it, it's been difficult for like the private cryptos, for example, to replicate their own banking system or their own uh, independent financial system. Do you think at some point in time um, it's all going to come to a head? And do you think that the public is going to push back sufficiently on, you know, the government and, and essentially at the end of the day, the BIS, which is really an international agency, it's not an American agency. Um, or do you think that there's a chance left for the people to say, to wake up and understand what's going on and to say, no, you know, we don't want to be a part of that system. Because ultimately, to me, that's the final battle. It's whether people recognize what's going on and how they're doing it, you know, and whether they push back and say, I don't care what you say, I'm not going to participate. Because at the end of the day, if you look at like Ann, Ann Rand and or Ayn Rand and her, you know, Atlas Shrugged, the only way to get out of the system is just to quit participating. Mm, the yeah. ability of people to create their own networks, their own cryptos, asset-backed digital currencies, things like that, are a threat to the system. Do, do you think that there's still a chance for the people to, you know, sort of regain their monetary freedom? Or do you think that the central banks have a pretty much ring fenced at this point through not only central bank policy, but federal and local and state laws? <laughs> Yeah, so I think there's a, there's a lot there. I, I think the one thing to remember, just one thing we haven't talked about with central banks, it's just, you know, and I'm sure your audience generally already understands this, but who owns the central banks, right? It, it, it is the JP Morgans and the city groups. So, you know, what you have to do is you have to look past the federal uh, board of governors that sits in D.C. and you have to look at the reserve banks, because when you look at like the seal of the Federal Reserve, it doesn't say Federal Reserve of the United States. It says Federal Reserve System. And they knew when they put it in, they needed to do a two tiered system. And, and it's the reserve banks which are actually owned by, you know, um, J.P. Morgan and Citigroup. Um, the the banks that own the reserve banks, like the New York Fed, this, the St. Louis Fed, they get to appoint six of the nine governors at each of these. So they control the boards. They're the owners. Um, you know, in 2017, there was a FOIA request asking the New York Fed to release, you know, who actually owns the New York Federal Reserve Bank. Um, they answered the request. Uh, interestingly, they said, look, we're not part of the government. We're under no obligation to respond to a FOIA request. But just in the matter of transparency, we'll go ahead and tell you. And the two biggest you know, shareholders in the New York Fed are, as I mentioned, JP Morgan and Citigroup, at least at that time. It can change. So the, 
th to protect this banking monopoly is really one of the main missions of the central banks. Um, you know, they talk about the mandates of full employment or price stability. Yeah, you know, those are kind of in there as, as things that they talk to the public about. But they also are essentially representing, as all organizations do, the interests of the owners. And, and the owners obviously are, are the commercial banks. So they want to protect that system at all costs. And there is definitely a threat. And that's why they're, they're kind of trying to co-op things, you know, doing the Bitcoin, the Ether ETFs, trying to bring these into BlackRock, you know, get that custody there. Um, one of the things with like a Bitcoin network, I'm by, by no means a tech guy, but I've, I've heard people talk about, you know, how could we ultimately, if our end game were to try to get around um, you know, this central banking system uh, use Bitcoin for payments. And it is tricky, but it seems to be, you know, possible. I guess on the base protocol layer of Bitcoin, like it can't handle, you know, the transaction volume necessary, but there are kind of ways to build upon the base layer in order to, you know, create like peer-to-peer -peer payment type systems that are encrypted and secure um, that use like eCash and Noster and different types of tech layers that are kind of above my pay grade with technology. But anyways, they, they, there's an envisioning of a way to, to create a, a you know, alternative monetary system. And that's really the big threat is that an alternative monetary system takes hold. I think they won't go down without a fight, but I do think there's hope because I think people are learning about it. You're at the Bitcoin conference. You know, I've, I originally come from a big precious metals, gold and silver background, but I, I see kind of the idea and the theory in Bitcoin that makes sense to me. I think gold is kind of what Bitcoin wants to be when it grows up. I don't think it's there yet. I think it's still going through a price discovery period, and that's why you have a lot of volatility associated with it. Um, we, we will see how the Bitcoin story turns out. But I think that regardless, there definitely are certain rails and technology frameworks that could be put into place, um, even if you had some sort of a precious metal backing, you know, alternative monetary system or a Bitcoin backed or a basket of reserve assets. You know, somebody comes up with a, a, a token that's like a mix of Bitcoin or gold and silver and people start using it. These are all massive threats. I think it requires like the people being, you know, motivated enough to begin to institute it. Um, and then it, it's going to be it's going to be a fight. Uh, we talked about the stablecoin bill, trying to co-opt the, the stablecoin market into the system. And I think what we're where we're heading, where the end game here is that we have such a massive sovereign debt bubble uh, that is going to come to a head probably in around the 27, mm -hmm. 28 time frame. Um, I pick those years because that's when we're going to be close to like the Social Security mm -hmm. Trust Fund going bankrupt and that's going to have to be dealt with. And I think how that all shakes out at that moment in time, like do they do a great reset and put in a global CBDC that gives UBI and it's like the ultimate uh, tyranny and economic control through technology run by the central banks or do people understand that and say, okay, you know, I'm now going to use this, uh, you know, alternative monetary basket as where I park my assets and it's outside of that system. And I think that's kind of the fight that's coming. I think that's why shows like this are valuable um, because it's getting the word out and it's educating people and it's making people think and say, hey, you know, maybe one of these alternative monetary systems actually would make sense. And if we can get a critical mass and people start to uh, believe in it, then I think it has hope. But I do think that every step of the way, they'll come at it. You know, they're not going to give up without mm -hmm. a fight. And I think that's that's what we're kind of witnessing play out in, in real time. But I think it's going to get even more intense as the fiscal trouble gets even more intense for uh, governments around the world because of their horrible balance sheets. Yeah, a couple of things I wanted to, to respond to. There was a lot there. By the way, I want to thank you for coming on the program because I think this program that you and I just did encapsulates very well from history to now sort of the monetary system and where it's going in, in a very clear format for people. We often cover it, but we cover, I mean, there's like epics along the way and we'll cover pieces, but that was a really good treatment of the whole thing. One of the things I want to comment on is I think you gave us a pretty good timeline for the potential reset. Um, I have been hypothesizing since 2018, it would be about the middle of this decade. It looks like you may have a couple more years based upon you know, when it becomes blatantly obvious that things are bankrupt, such as the entitlement programs, that that may be the catalyst for 
you know, a revaluation of the treasuries, which makes sense to me because once it becomes obvious, you can't deny it, it's going to force the bond market to react. It's going to force it to reprice American treasuries, maybe via interest rates, maybe via what, what the treasury is able to get when it's doing its auctions and it may a lot of different ways. So that gives us a good timeline for when this may occur. And I've been saying for years, you know, time is running out and I feel like the bill, the boy that cried wolf, but I, you know, it, I do think that your arguments around that are, are something that are, you know, wise for people to take heed in terms of timelines. This dollar system can't go forever. There are mathematical limits to it. We've seen that in history. And certainly at some point in time with de-dollarization and the rest of the world kind of taking their positioning, you know, that has to come to a head. Nobody's going to finance our deficits forever because it impacts them too much to do it. It's gotten mathematically, it's gotten to the point where the system's going to, you know, it's going to have to reset in some way. Um, you know, the, the other is, can we get the education, the legislation and things like that out for people? And I think, you know, my, my career in studying this has come to the point at which I, you know, I'm a big gold silver guy, because if you hold it and it's, you know, not trackable like gold, um, you're, you're effectively outside the system. Um, and I think the alternative cryptocurrencies are another way to do it. Uh, they're different characteristics in gold, but it may be another way to do it, but I think um, it's interesting to note that, you know, we're we don't have very long and we're going to have to make choices. And that's why I'm focused so heavily on the education piece and through Citizens for Sound Money, you know, trying to get that legislation. And even if we don't get all the legislation passed, it's 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 getting people to understand what's going on, uh, which really is the key. And and all movements are based upon knowledge, uh, transparency, access to information. And, you know, the media is a result of people trying to find their own truth as they sit in the system and go, wait a minute, this is not what we're told. Um, do you, in terms of the treasury market, do you suspect that once the treasury market sort of blows up or reaches its, you know, its breaking point, do you think that they're going to come out and say, OK, it's the dollar's fault. Here's your central bank digital currency. We've been you know, working on this. And do you think that people will accept that? Do you think there's enough awakening to where people kind of look at that side eye and say, wait a minute, you guys have this in place? Because you said people don't follow the BIS. So a lot of people don't even know there's a central bank digital currency project, you know, Project Orem, Enbridge, you know, all of those. Do you suspect that are we at the point do you think there's enough of awakening where enough people are going to opt for these alternative strategies, whether it be cryptos or metals or whatever, or do you think that, that, you know, the, the, the power is still on the side of, of the banking elites, essentially, because it seems like it's the people against the bankers. You know, if I'm mm -hmm. simplifying the argument, where do you, is that enough time, that two to three year window to get people educated on that? Um, and do you think there's going to be enough of an impetus to prevent the central banks from kind of shoving the CBDCs down their throat during a time of crisis, because it's going to happen during a time of crisis. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, the, the exact timing of it is probably the trickiest part. And mm -hmm. I think that what happens a lot of the times is it's it's we almost underestimate the amount of rabbits that these people can pull out of a hat because mm -hmm. they, they they're so sneaky. I mean, we didn't even get into things like the uh, is the letter, the International Securities and Derivatives Association letter to the Fed and the FDIC asking that treasuries be removed from their supplementary reserve ratio calculation so they could almost hold unlimited amounts of treasuries. Uh, we, we've seen a lot of shenanigans with the Treasury Department lately with the amount of bills they're issuing relative to coupons, um, which is essentially kind of a quantitative easing light. Uh, Nouriel Rabini just came out with a paper saying, you know, the, by, by front loading so many bills, it's almost like a hundred percent or a hundred basis point interest rate cut in what they're doing because it's essentially printing money with, with these T-bills. Um, and so there's a lot of these rabbits that they keep pulling out of their hats. And I think, but, but I do think that like you said, there's kind of a mathematical endpoint. It's just tough to, to gauge when exactly that endpoint gets hit, but I think that it is rapidly approaching. Um, what is going to happen? Do we have enough time? I think we do actually, but I think I think what we're heading into, and it, and it's starting to break into the 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 common culture, 
is some of the awareness of these monetary issues, which used to be for like gold bugs or maybe tinfoil hat guys. And I think it's getting a little bit more into the mainstream now. And I think when you look at US history, you can see that there are periods where this happens, where actually monetary issues are front and center. So it happened at the end of the 1800s with the free silver movement, when the government made a big move to take silver out of the, what we'd been traditionally a bimetallic country and essentially remove silver and, and just have gold. And we had the Williams Jennings Bryant fa famous cross of gold speech, um, where these monetary issues were kind of part of the zeitgeist. And they're kind of coming back into that. And I think, you know, a collapse would put that front and center uh, so that people would be like, oh, wow, we really do have to have some sort of an alternative or a fix here. And so I, I think that's when it's going to be, you know, kind of this, this end battle of them saying, we've got this amazing solution. It's a central bank digital currency. And I think they're going to have all kinds of incentives like, you know, we're going to do a UBI if you don't meet an income threshold. And there's going to be all these reasons that they're going to create for people to download their digital Fed wallet and start using these. And they're going to make it difficult for people to basically say no. And it might be that people wind up needing to uh, use the system a little bit. I don't know. But that, that, that but the bulk of the economic system that's currently where people just have their money in checking accounts at banks and then those banks go out and use it this way i think coming up with an alternative to that that's going to be the time that hopefully it can get wider adoption and get used and a whole because i think in the long run that's to everybody's benefit except for the bank cartels which have their monopoly over over money creation so i think that's that's the battle we're heading i'm optimistic i think there'd be, be pain along the way I think we'll see, you know, uh, uh, financial turmoil, uh, super hyper volatility, uh, you know, probably plummeting equity uh, prices for a while. We're going to see some of these things, you know, take place, but that's going to be an opportunity for us. And it's going to be they're going to see that as an opportunity for them. And I think with the the growing awareness that that it's actually a good fight, it's not going to be easy for them. And I think if we uh, work hard and people, you know, get the word out. And I think if kind of brilliant innovators that care about this, you know, create systems that are viable alternatives, uh, there's some hope for, for success. But I guess it's still uh, to be determined exactly how this is all going to play out in the end. Yeah. And I think from an awareness perspective uh, at the Bitcoin conference this week, the keynote is Trump. You have Kennedy, who's also a presidential <clears throat> candidate, and there are rumors circulating right now. The conference is not open. It's all set up today. Um, we're here early on a, on a special pass, but there's rumors that uh, Kamala Harris, which will be the Democratic, uh, presumptive, I guess, Democratic uh, nominee will be here as well. So at least in the executive branch, there's an acknowledgement around Bitcoin and alternative currencies at the very least. So there definitely seems to be um, it, at the very least, and it could be a political thing. It could be appealing to young voters or it could be an acknowledgement by the executive branch that, hey, you know, this has reached an awareness level that we need to be a part of the conversation, which I, I do think is a positive towards uh, the awakening of the people and, and that intersection with, you know, traditional politics. Uh, real quickly, before we end up, tell us about your, your book, uh, why you wrote it and how people uh, can get access to that if they're interested in reading it. Yeah, so I, I really tried to combine you know, two, two of my passions, kind of the monetary world, monetary history, and I'm also a big... Uh, thriller fan, uh, kind of Tom Clancy type stuff. And I, I, I thought it would be great to create a, a thriller, but instead of like CIA operatives, you know, being the center of it all, like it would be corrupt central bankers. It would, uh, a lot of quas takes place at the Bank for International Settlements in Basel. Um, and so it's really about kind of a, a, a near future world where a quantum AI supercomputer has kind of taken over the financial markets and the, the the corrupt bankers behind the scenes working to put in a global uh, central bank digital currency and uh there's a, a hero a guy named roy o'connor who kind of has to step in and figure things out so if people are interested in these uh topics that we discussed this last you know 45 minutes um but they also like thrillers fiction um i think they they would enjoy quas it's available more or less wherever books are sold, audio version, paperback version, Kindle, uh, eBooks, all that stuff. And so if they're interested, they can just search Quaz, financial thriller, and, and it should pop up.
Well, Mel, thanks for coming on the program. Uh, good luck uh, on the book. I know you've had a lot of success with it, so congratulations on that. And we appreciate you taking the time to kind of educate us on monetary history. There are certainly elements of this discussion that our audience hasn't seen before and that I think will be very informative. And the way that we kind of put it together in a, in a single 45-minute segment will be really good for people who are new to this, trying to get a grasp on how all this stuff works. Finance, you know, is historically been purposefully vague and difficult to understand to keep people from understanding. And I don't know if it's Henry Ford that said, if people understood how the system really works overnight, there would be a revolution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly a lot of the big capitalists have understood it, the bankers have understood it, and maybe we're finally in a period in which the, you know, the general public is sort of getting the gist of it. Uh, but appreciate you coming on and, uh, you know, maybe we'll have you on again as well in, in the future. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. And uh, I completely agree. It's important to get to get the word out. So happy to join anytime. All right. I better go. It looks like they're uh, setting up at the, the Bitcoin conference about to kick us out. But appreciate it, Mel. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.